much late. Um, so we're going to have to keep it running. So first we have um, um, Dr. Santana presenting um, his talk, uh, Development of a High Performance Ultrasonic Flow System for Cell Transformation. And uh, I'd encourage everyone to try to be done in 10 minutes um, so we can spread out the time we've lost. Evenly. All right, so let's get started. So I'm going to be talking about blood today. So currently, there are some issues with blood, and one of them is being that it has a short shelf life. So it can only be stored for 42 days at 4 degrees Celsius before it must be used or it has to be pitched. And this, this system is depicted, uh, dependent highly on predictive modeling and cold chain transportation to ensure enough blood supply is met around the United States. In addition, over 21 million blood units are transfused annually in the United States. On top of that, there are over 400 different types of hemoglobin, which means that they have different risk and clinical diagnosis. And then additionally, there are currently long-term storage techniques, but they are complicated in methods, and it requires negative 80 degree storage, so it just prevents it from using it on the battlefield or in some uh, clinical centers that are in rural environments. So our, our goal is to store red blood cells for long term at ambient temperatures. So to come up with this resolution, we are inspired by nature. So we are inspired by a sea monkey, which is able to undergo desiccation without the alteration of the cell membrane. And this is done by a molecule called trailose. And trailers is a non-reducing sugar and is currently used in vaccines and food products. So I'm going to talk about two main components of how we will be doing this. And one component is the microbubble. Microbubble has been approved by the FDA for decades now. It is commonly used as a contra contrast agent, but more recently has been developed for gene delivery and drug delivery. The typical size is about two to three microns so it can travel through the capillaries. The core is typically composed of a plethora carbon, and the shell is typically composed of a polymer, protein, or phospholipid to stabilize the structure. And then the other component is ultrasound. So ultrasound, you typically think of imaging, but it can also be used for therapeutics. So in this case, we have a microbubble near the cell membrane. You rupture this um, microbubble, and it causes microjetting at the cell membrane, causing a transient pore in the cell. And then once that occurs, trailers gets actively pushed into the cell. Within about a minute, the uh, transient pore will close, and then now the trailers is stuck inside the cell. And so originally we came up with a bulk process setup, and this was just a feasibility idea. Can we apply ultrasound with microbubbles in solution to help trailers get across the cell membrane? And so there were some issues with this setup. Is one is it's not homogeneous, and so the loading efficiency wasn't very good. There were some that had high levels of concentration, and then there were some cells that had no levels of concentration. And so the ones, especially on the lower end of concentration, are not able to survive desiccation. So our potential solution is using a flow system that we call ultrasonic flow to enable consistent loading of each cell. So now I'm going to talk about that real quick. We just here are some just designs that we did. We did different channel sizes. We use a concentric spiral, and that idea was to allow it to be in the ultra, uh, ultrasound beam profile for as long as possible. So here's just a small device. It can, contains a piezoelectric transducer on top of the concentric spiral, and the ultrasound is applied as the microbubbles and cells are going through solution. So it has an inlet and outlet. And then so this was just to conceptualize what was the best parameter. So we went from no ultrasound all the way up to 40 milliliters per hour. 40 milliliters per hour was the limit in this device. We have since gone past that and the different devices. But for this, we found that 30 milliliters per hour was the optimal setup for getting trailers into the cell. And then from there, we compared the bulk system 
to the uh, flow system. And from this, we found that there is a linear increase as you incorporate more microbubbles in the solution volume by volume, and then additionally, the flow system enhances the loading efficiency compared to static. So next, we looked at red blood, red blood cell recovery after freezing drying process. So as you can tell, there's two different, there's the microfluidic device and there's the static. The static, you don't see much red blood cells recovered with either the PBS or NLB, which are just two different solutions to help enhance the cell surviving. And then with the flow system, you see much more recovery, almost up to 40% with the 10% volume by volume of micro bubbles. And then from there, once we are able to recover them, we wanted to look at the percent, vi percent viability based on the solution. So we found that NLB isn't as good as PBS and uh, viability, but it does enhance the amount of red blood cells that are recovered. So I just wanted to show a quick SEM, SEM image on the left is when there's no trailers in solution. And as you can tell, there's no red, viable red blood cells in solution. And then you look at the one on the right with trailers after 42 days and rehydration that red blood cells are intact. So the conclusion, sonar preparation appears to be effective method for intracellular delivery of trailers. Further design should be considered to enhance uniform intracellular delivery. Different drying approaches should be considered such as spray drying to see if that has an enhanced effect in recovery. And then ultrasonic flow may be used for other techniques such as delivery to T cells. And so acknowledgments, this was funded by UofL Excite program. And just a disclosure, some of the co-authors are co-inventors on a pending patent, and they have um, focus on commercialization with a technology company called Desacor. Thanks for the excellent timing. <laughs> um, good start. So any questions about sea monkeys? <laughs> um, who is going to be your primary? So, because you did the I core and everything, who's going to be like your primary target for the consumer market? So, we see that it could be potentially for many uses. One is for laboratory use because you have a uniform culture, mm -hmm. especially like 96 wall plates, then you just rehydrate it and then you can use it for that. You can use it and military uses because if you're in a far forward environment then you don't have access to negative 80 degrees celsius refrigerator mm -hmm. um it can be used in rural hospitals it can be used for potentially a lot of how easy okay. um, how easily like resource are all the materials that you talked about like, um, the entire kit is like a kit so we Really, we, I'm focused more on the technology aspect, so the point is to make a small device to where it can process red blood cells and then you just sh it can be shipped somewhere and then you just use water to rehydrate it. So what about the viability of the cells after they've been dehydrated and rehydrated? Yeah, so there, there are some limitations, that you, as you can tell, there's only about a 40% recovery right now. Um, compared to the initial setup, it was, it was 8% initially, and now it's 40%. So there needs to be further optimization of the device to make sure that there's enough trailers in the right concentration of trailers in the cell to preserve it. And so we plan on using a spray dryer as well, which is less harsh on the cell. So you should see better viability through that. Any other questions? Oh, let's thank the speaker again. Um, next up, we have uh, Shruti Suresh from Purdue University talking about optimal feature selection for the detection of autonomic distress 
this reflects Flex, yeah. yeah there you go Jeez. Uh, yeah <laughs> yeah that Sorry. must refer to something about speech impediments I actually no uh, you'll be surprised in individuals with <laughs> tetraplegia all right let's see if this works come on all right um, so thank you so much for the introduction. So my name is Shruti. I'm a PhD student at the School of Biomedical Engineering at Purdue University. And today I'm going to be talking about autonomic dysreflexia and how it affects people with spinal cord injuries. So um, how many of you actually know about spinal cord injuries at all? Perfect. There's a couple hands and this is fantastic. So let's start with a quick introduction to the autonomic nervous system. How many of you have heard of the so sympathetic and the parasympathetic nervous system? I'm guessing the same hands are going to go up. Okay. For those of you that don't know, the non-scientific term for that is the fight or flight response and the rest and digest response. So the fight or flight response is in charge of amping up your heart rate like mine is right now. Uh, <laughs> it ma manages your pupillary responses and the rest and digest system, also known as the parasympathetic, counters that. So it's the exact opposite. They work perfectly in tandem with each other in people with normally functioning nervous systems. However, in the case of spinal cord injuries, what happens is a very interesting phenomenon called autonomic dysreflexia. And what that is, is actually your sympathetic nervous system going into hyperdrive. And that can be caused by various, very simple sort of stimuli, which you may not even realize is going on in your body, especially because after a spinal cord injury, you lose sensation below the level of injury, right? So it could be something as simple as restrictive clothing, a full bladder, urinary tract infection, so any of these simple sounding triggers can lead to a ridiculous rise in your blood pressure. So we call that systolic hypertension. And what happens in that is because it cannot be controlled by your body, because there's no way for your parasympathetic nervous system to react to that rise in blood pressure, it starts overreacting above your level of injury. And what that means is you start experiencing excessive sweating, you start having crazy headaches, and imagine having pounding headaches which last for days without you knowing what the cause of your headache is. It's a big problem and a lot of times people are not informed about how to manage it. And poor management can lead to hemorrhages, strokes, and in a lot of scenarios, death. Which is not great because the median age for someone with a spinal cord injury is 19. At 19, you don't really want to think about, oh my god, I have to manage my health care, I have to manage how I sit, how I lie down in bed. You don't want to deal with that. So the crux of the problem is that only 41% of all people with spinal cord injuries are actually aware of this problem, which is ridiculous because a lot of them experience it without even knowing what it's called. So other than trying to get the word out there about autonomic dysreflexia, we're also trying to realize that 22% of people reported symptoms that were unrecognized, right? And this is a key issue, especially in today's world of information technology. So currently, the gold standard is knowing and managing your own symptoms. Again, at 19, who really wants to care that much about what your body is going through? Um, so what they have right now is something called an autonomic dysreflexia wallet card. It's something that everyone with a spinal cord injury is given after, but there's so much information given to them after an injury that they, don't, they lose track of it. And Blood pressure monitoring is something that's been tried in clinics because that's how you get to know that spinal cord, um, that autonomic dysreflexia is happening. Similarly, we have galvanic skin response, which is a measure of sweating. So sweating is the most obvious phenomenon, the obvious symptom of autonomic dysreflexia, and that's what ends up showing up. There is currently no real-time detection of AD. You think in a world just so instant, like you have pretty much everything at the snap of your fingers, you'd expect autonomic dyslexia detection to be something instantaneous. So what we decided to do at Purdue is, we, uh, well, in my lab, rather, is that we decided to try to find a way to detect this problem in an easy to adopt clinical workflow methodology. So what we did was we collected data from people with spinal cord injuries using a smartwatch. How many of you own a smartwatch? Okay, a few hands. Okay, um, so the Microsoft Band was a very good research smartwatch that Microsoft came up with. Unfortunately, it no longer is in production, but it has a galvanic skin response sensor, which is a good way for you to know if you're sweating or not. There's also a heart rate sensor and a skin temperature sensor. We use that, integrated it with an Android application, which basically allows a person to report whether or not they were feeling dysreflexic. 
So um, the way that we set up the experiment was we recruited nine subjects from um, the Purdue University um, Disability Resources Center as well as the Rehabilitation Hospital of Indiana. And they were asked to take the entire system home for a duration of one week. Now all these subjects had experienced autonomic dysreflexia. They were aware of what the problems were, the symptoms were, all the different things. And they were performing daily tasks, which didn't, so none of this interfered with their activity of daily life. And they were asked to report any um, event the moment it began, which is what that app um, was allowing them to do. So once we collected all that information, we decided to use machine learning because, not because it's a hot topic or anything, um, but because it's actually useful in this application because it is going to be an unbalanced data set where you have more reports of non-AD than you would of AD, right? So I'll now use Flexia, it's just gonna be called AD from now on because it's a math ball. Um, so a support vector machine is a classifying machine learning algorithm. I'm sure everybody in this room knows about this but I'll just say it anyway. It is a highly accurate classifier, and in this case, we only have two classes. Again, normal and AD. Um, so plus one was gonna be our dysreflectic state, and minus one was our uh, non-dysreflectic state. So feature selection is a key part of any classifier. So when you select the right features, you develop a much better classifier, and it's very important in improving the performance of the entire system. So. A classifier, um, sorry, a support vector machine works by weighting out your features, right? So each, the weight vector is what ends up changing the way your classifier or your hyperplane is shaped. So it serves, it can serve as a feature ranking tool. So in this case, we only had three features. So we weren't really looking at reducing our number of features. So we didn't do a PCA. We didn't do any of those standard factor reduction methods. So instead, we chose to go with two commonly um, existing and commonly used weighting strategies. So we use feature importance. So we use bagging methods. So we ended up using random forests, extra trees. Um, all those basically reduce the variance of the base estimator. And what this allows us to do is get the weights of the nodes which are the most important. So we al we're able to find out what weight of what feature allows us to come up with the best classifier which can differentiate between the two things. Right? So um, each node was assigned a different split point, and then basically that allows us to extract our values. And the recursive feature elimination is something I'm sure all of you have heard of. In fact, in the last talk that was in here, there was actually talk of a feature elimination. So that's essentially removing one feature at a time, and then just identifying what the uh, performance of your support vector machine is going to be. So here's the general workflow. Now that I have a little <coughs> pointer, okay. So the data is then fed into this support vector machine, which is basically a dot product of your feature and your weights, and the weights are selected by feature importance and RIP. And that develops your model, and then a predicted label comes up. Yeah? Um, so to evaluate the performance, we use standard metrics that everyone in machine learning uses. So we use accuracy, we use sensitivity, specificity, and area under the ROC curve. So our confusion matrix is really simple because there's only two classes. Um, so we had predicted AD and actual AD with a true positive and predicted non-AD and actual non-AD with a true negative. Right? So what we ended up with, this is a very big table, but the crux of it is just that for each of our uh, features, so this is galvanic skin response, heart rate, and skin temperature, using the different feature selection strategies, we got different weights for each of these. So the last one is basically an equal weightage to all three features that we used. And the extra trees method gave us a specific set of weights and similarly with random forest. And the highest um, accuracy for training and testing, as well as the highest specificity and sensitivity, was of the weights determined by the extra trees. Right? And that's basically a large percentage of the weights given to galvanic skin response a uh, decent amount given to skin temperature and the smallest amount given to heart rate. And I'll explain those results in just a second. Another thing we noticed was with our, okay, this chart is weird, but there's supposed to be a little plane that cuts right through that. So you can tell that based on those weights, there's actually a very clear divide between our AD and our non-AD data, right? Um, so what this really means, this basically brings back the fact that 
again, the most common symptoms of autonomic dysreflexia are sweating, a crazy change in heart rate, and because of sweating, your skin temperature tends to automatically drop. And obviously, this makes sense because the two parameters for sweating are going to be the ones that have the maximum weightage because that's the best way for you to detect the onset. That's something that people with AD themselves know is that the moment they start sweating profusely, they're in trouble and they need to manage themselves better. But knowing that you can do this by just using a smartwatch with only three sensors allows us to improve the way that we might detect it. So one of the ways that we want to ex like expand this work in the future is we want to allow more sensors to be put in. We want to have, rather than relying on the subject for them to tell us whether they're experiencing AD or not, we're going to have a constant blood pressure measure which is able to serve as the ground truth, right? So we're able to know whether the person is actually going into a state of AD or not. So we had a bunch of false positives. A lot of that was accounted to the fact that maybe they forgot to report that they were experiencing AD, right? It takes a while for you to take out a tablet from your phone, put in the like key in that you're feeling AD or not feeling AD. So the main thing we want to use an advanced version of this PTS, which is a physiological telemetry system, is what we want to be a training tool for newly injured individuals. We want them to know that, hey, you're going to experience this problem really soon. We need you to change your position or do something to manage your AD better. Do the things that you were taught in rehab. Do the things that will prevent you from experiencing a crazy headache in a few seconds, and it will change your life drastically. In fact, one of the subjects that we tested this on told us that without this machine, without this system, informing him that he was going to experience AD, he might have actually died just because he was lying down in bed, no one was around, and somehow this thing was able to detect it before he started feeling symptoms himself. And the moment he detected it, he called his caregiver to come get him upright. And if he hadn't called, his caregiver was just going to leave. So if he hadn't called his caregiver, there's a very good chance that he may have not been able to adjust his position in his bed, and it may have led to a lot more complications. So providing continuous medical oversight to that, that situation where the caregiver is away from you and you can still let them know that it's going to happen and they can help is something that we want to try to improve in the future. So what's next is basically improving our communication and improving the machine learning algorithm that I've already talked about. But, so we'd just like to thank uh, the Rehab Hospital of Indiana and the Purdue University Discovery Park for helping out with this research as much as they could. And yeah, thank you so much for being an attentive audience. I'll take any questions. Yes. Yeah, I have like a composite question. Sure. Uh, first of all, do you think like my subject is enough for the classification? That's one. Uh, the second one, uh, what kind of kernel did you use for the support vector machine? Is it a linear, Gaussian, uh, whatever the, the kernel? Uh, the, the third one, uh, can you, can you come back with the table? Yeah. I see like the training accuracy is 94.44 and the, the, there is another scenario with the random forest 94.43, but I was like surprised that the testing accuracy for the random forest is higher than the exo trees. So, and actually the, the, the rock curve also, or the area under the curve is, uh, is higher than the extra trees than the random forest. So I, I, I can't understand this kind of things. It's like, I think it's confusing a little bit. Um, so can you explain this better? Right. Um, so for your kernel question, it would have been obvious if this figure was right. It's a linear kernel, mm -hmm. um, which surprisingly worked better. So in our past papers, we've tried to use RBF kernels. Uh, but with equal weightage to all three features, or just removing uh, one of the features. Um, but it was a linear kernel. Um, as for your question about the subjects, yes, yeah. nine subjects is very low. But then you have to realize that people with spinal cord injuries is a small population. So finding people with spinal cord injuries that can yeah, suit pretty hard. the yeah. in Indiana is yeah, a very niche population. So yes, I agree. We're trying to see if we can do a rat study instead where we can <laughs> increase our number and maybe see if there's a similar reaction. As for the decision trees and uh, random forest, yeah, I'm a little confused too. It baffles me as well that that could have been the case. I think usually it's flipped over yeah. where it's like a better performing with a random forest. But the, perf the performance, honestly, is so similar, it's really difficult That's what to I'm choose. Saying, yeah. So in our case, we wanted a more sensitive model. Okay. And a lot of that is because 
Um, when you have AD, if something doesn't classify some, uh, an event as AD, mm -hmm. I would rather have a less accurate model and something that just over, like always tells me that I'm feeling AD. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe not all of the time, but you get my point. So you want something that is a little more sensitive to the detection of the problem than anything else. So for that reason, we went with the expertise, but again, they're so similar in performance yeah. that yeah. either of them will just work as well. Thanks. But yeah. I'm, I'm going to throw in a quick question. Sure. Maybe I didn't catch it. So these patients went home with this watch and work continuously for a week? Yes. Or a a week? week, yeah. Okay. So eight hours a day was what we were asking them to do. Some of them did 10, some of them did 6. Okay. But yeah. Now, who determines ground truth and how? So ground truth in our case was their personal experience of AD. In this case, which is a little problematic just because a lot of the subjects may be used to being feeling that way and that might be their baseline and then sudden events may be wrong, which is why in the future we want to have a more quantitative number. So we want to do blood pressure monitoring instead of relying on them to tell us what that thing is. So their self-reporting was considered ground truth for this paper. So for the blood pressure measurement, is it like kind of about the standard, right? Yes. So what, what's the standard? What like? Pressure lowers for some High. levels? Higher. So, it, uh, so a 20% increase in systolic blood pressure is what the gold standard is in clinical uh, measurements. So as long as you've got, so they have two versions. They have either, oh sorry, a 30% increase in paroxysmal um, blood pressure or a increase of 20 millimeters of mercury. Which those are the two things that they look at to make sure that the person's going through it. But um, we didn't use blood pressure monitoring because we wanted to keep this a completely wearable system. With a blood pressure cuff, you end up having a lot of different noise issues. You have a lot of um, data that can get lost just because the person may not be wearing the cuff at that time. And it's an annoying thing. You don't want to affect their daily life that drastically. Uh, yeah. To be fair to other speakers, we've got to cut this short. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, thank you again. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, we have He's going to talk to us about developing rehab practices using virtual reality XR gaming. Did everyone bring their joysticks? I'm just not going to make you play it. I briefly considered bringing it down, but it's a pretty expensive setup. Alright, let's. All right, so developing we have practices with um, virtual reality extra gaming. So extra gaming, it's kind of like sneaking exercise into, into gaming because let's face it, all of us take that big great news resolution like, oh, we're all gonna do uh, a bunch of exercise like twice a week, we're gonna stick to it and then like halfway through Jan, we're like just eating donuts and uh, watching uh, Netflix. So it doesn't really happen. It's the same with uh, people with uh, spinal cord injuries. So let's go back to a little bit of motivation. Um, should they have a bunch of uh, like background on the spinal cord injury population? Here I'm looking at a different aspect, more on the rehabilitation um, exercise um, side of things. So there are like 300,000 uh, people in the United States alone with uh, spinal cord injury and like 20,000 cases each year. Um, it's, it's a smaller population compared to the other bigger um, um, kind of groups that people look at, but still, still pretty big. And for this group, exercise is super uh, important, um, just because they already have such a limited uh, mobility, and just just controlling, like pressing buttons or joysticks with a wheelchair, um, making sure they're in shape, uh, making sure they're exercising, uh, goes a long way just to get their functional independence levels and like day-to-day -day activities, like brushing your teeth, just grooming your hair, you know, simple things that we all take for granted can be really hard for them. Um, and a lot of studies have shown that exercise really improves your functional capacity a lot. And the issue is, exercise is hard for us. We don't stick to it. And it's, rehab is even harder for them because it's something they were, they're used to doing, you know, and then suddenly just kind of a, after an acute injury just goes away and then there's a lot of frustrations, like I could do this before, and there's a lot of like a motivation, frustration um, over there. So the rehabilitation time has also gone down in the last 40 years. I believe it's like two to three weeks right now. So your inpatient rehab 
right after the accident. This is a major accident. Your spinal cord just got cut. And three weeks, that's really, that's really um, not, not enough. And, and for example, in the previous talk, where Shruti was talking about AD, all of those symptoms just show up like several months afterwards. So they don't even know about this when they're in the hospital, which is, which is crazy. Um, so moving on to um, extra gaming, there's been a bunch of studies um, which have shown uh, extra gaming improves adherence to rehab at home. Uh, this was uh, done in the um, elderly, I believe, and it's also used to assist elderly in just um, different motions. And it's an and VR is an emerging uh, game tool. It's it's getting com getting commercial. You can buy these um, uh, VR gaming sets for like five hundred dollars these days, which is great. Uh, it means it's something that's affordable. It's not like a really expensive twenty thousand dollars system that is at a hospital and like you have to timeshare it or, or something along those lines. But the real big issue with all of this really is that. It's not designed with these people with tetraplegia in mind. It's designed for, for, for able-bodied people. And a lot of things, again, like I said, we take for granted just, just isn't, isn't um, present. I'll, I'll go into the details in just a bit. So the device that I have, uh, that we picked, is the HTC Vive. Um, anybody familiar with the HTC Vive here? Tried it out? Not, not really. All right. So this is part of the system where it's designed for a home. You can buy it at Best Buy, and then you can install it at home. It has these lighthouses uh, that you see. It's sort of like indoor GPS satellites, kind of. It is infrared, and it scans and gives you, gives uh, a really high, uh, really accurate, uh, real-time 3D coordinates of, of uh, whatever it's tracking. And you wear a head-mounted display, and like you hold on to controllers in your hand. And these controllers are tracked real-time. Your head is tracked real-time, so as you turn, um, everything is, is, is real time, like looking at 90 hertz, so you don't get motion sick, none of that usual stuff that VR used to have like a few years ago. So, HTC Vive is great, it's commercial, it's cheap, uh, tracked in 3D space. So, let's look at the controller that that little model guy was holding on to. That is um, something that's designed to be grasped in our hands. So, I have to hold it. There are like um, squeeze buttons, so I have to squeeze it. That's, that's pretty hard. Not, not, not a lot of them can have finger uh, dexterity. There are like a trigger, so that's like your index finger triggering it. It's a touchpad, so you're looking at really fine uh, motor control with the thumb. And, and there are like really small buttons that I can't press sometimes when I have the headset on just because I have no idea where they are. It's, it gets harder. So, these will not fly. We couldn't use these. So when I first started out, I ended up like kind of like taping it up uh, on 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 our professor who uh, is the tetraplegic himself. But that's not gonna that's not gonna work for a uh, long term. So they also have these um, trackers uh, from HTC Vive that we purchased. Uh, so these are actually designed to put on like your feet, so that in virtual uh, reality in the games you have like a whole body tracking kind of thing. So you can walk and then you can see your feet walking and all of those kind of things. So it's really not designed to be put on your hand, and none of the games that exist out there really support it. So it's, but we just decided let's use this because then uh, we just had to print this, uh, design this little 3D printed plate. You can't really see it here, but it goes in between, and then we could put a Velcro attachment below, and then you could strap it onto people's hands, which is great. The issue though is all the games out there that we could find were designed for that guy there. So that has a whole bunch of um, manipulative uh, buttons that you can manipulate with. And they're all not present here, which means none of these games that are available right now are all that entire library of games that people have put a lot of time and effort making. It's not accessible, and we just can't use it. So I managed to um, get that, make this um, act like it's that. So the software th is like tricked into thinking it's a controller, but it doesn't work just because, like I said, the buttons don't work. And we ended up developing um, a game from scratch. So, and I developed it, I'm not a game dev, <laughs> I'm doing my master, so I had to pick it up. It's, it's, it's um, sort of uh, stripped down bare bones, but we're looking at just the motivation side of things. Uh, we're trying to keep it simple. And we did, we got the IRB, that, that took a while, and we, we, did, we have like four subjects. It's really small, I know nine, you thought nine was small. Four <laughs> is even, uh, even smaller. We've only been conducting this for like uh, two to three months now. We're, we're, we're definitely recruiting more subjects and we're, we're running this um, longer. And about the game, I, I thought instead of explaining how I designed it and, and bore you to death, I have a little video of one of our subjects um, playing the game. So this is um, actually this baseline tool that I developed where there are a bunch of spheres that kind of spawn around you. Um, just to give you context, you are looking at the person interacting with the virtual space. 
as if you were like in a mixed environment. So these, all these balls, these spheres are virtual. He is obviously real, and the background is <laughs> is real. So it's it's a mixed reality setup here. Um, so you, you're kind of seeing both. You can't feel those spheres in case you're wondering. You, you, no, you can't. It just feels like you're moving through air. There's no resistance, nothing. Um, so that, that's the uh, virtual world, and he sees it from his point of view, if you can imagine that. Um, and what I, my instructions to him was basically, there are a bunch of spheres that are going to spawn around you, push them as far as you can. Uh, the spheres are, these, these balls, these spheres are just, it's just a goal. It's just something that's a visual stimulus, just something for you to do. Uh, because if I just ask you to flail your arms around uh, without a stimulus, it's, it's kind of boring, there's no point, people don't do it. You don't really push to your limits. So that was the purpose behind this. Um, and the background and extraction and everything, uh, we did it with like a little green screen, so we extracted so that so that we could remove that and replace it with the background and everything. Um, so what we did with this setup over here is for each individual, we repeated what, what you just saw in the previous video um, three times. The first time with the headset. The second time, you put on the headset for 10, 10 seconds, and then I take it off. So you have a rough idea of in 3D space where all the balls are, and you've already played this once before. And I'm, ask, I'm gonna ask you to like push them all up. Just context, this seems like a really hard task. These, these spheres are really not that far away. You could, if you accidentally move your hand over here, you're gonna bump, start hitting them. So they're really, really close to you. And, the and then we do this for the third time with the headset again. What's the reason, why are we doing this? Um, the real reason we wanted to do, uh, do this is for like gauging motivation, engagement. How much does that virtual reality aspect of it really motivate the individual to do this? Um, so each, each trial lasted about two minutes. Two minutes sounds pretty short, uh, but you're welcome to come up to Purdue sometime and try it out. It tires you out. Two, two <laughs> minutes doesn't seem like long, but you don't do this for two minutes nonstop every day. It's, it's, it's tiring for me when I have to do this. Um, so yeah, this is what I was explaining. It's uh, to compare the effect of VR versus no VR. We have three trials, VR, no VR, and VR. And, be, and just because of time, um, the last trial with the VR should have the most fatigue. So if there's any effect of fatigue that's affecting trial two, trial three should have it or have more of it. So we, we kind of remove that when we, do the, um, when we look at statistics. So that's, that's kind of what we see. Um, so red is first trial, green is uh, trial two without VR, and blue is um, uh, third trial with VR. So that's where the person's head roughly was. Um, and I'm gonna jump to the, the result. Again, it's just four people, so statistics is there's not that much uh, power here that we have. This was a non-parametric uh, permutation test that I did. Uh, we looked at basically the starting position of the spheres, uh, the displacement that it was displaced by, and then we looked at how we basically jumbled them randomly and then compared it to the, the data that we had. So we, we saw that there was a significant difference between uh, VR and no VR basically, and between the two uh, VR trials, there was not a significant difference. But moving on to the more, um, I would say, interesting um, aspect is really the kind of uh, data that we can get out of this. Um, that's a 3D graph that I'm going to uh, click on that, and nothing's going to happen. Because, right. Yeah, so this is, a three, this is a, like a 3D graph over here. And if you can imagine, um, the person's head is over there. These are all the spheres that were untouched. So those are the undisplaced ones because they're well behind the person, they can't fit it. And these are the spheres that have been displaced. Then I'll get to what that big blurb of mess that's over there uh, in just a sec. Um, I'm gonna just do that over there. Um, so like I said, the spheres are really just, a, we're looking at a goal. It's just like a virtual stimulus. We're not really trying to assess where the spheres are going. But we're uh, tracking the person's um, wrist, the, the end effector of the hand. Uh, in 3D space the entire time at about 90 hertz um, um, something rate. And I'm basically just taking all of it and I do a kernel density estimate here to get a probability distribution over that space. And then I have some thresholding to remove, uh, to remove some of the lower uh, scores. And then you plot it and you get this nice little heat map. And look, it's really bright red there. What's going on there? Not many circles were displaced. Not many spheres were displaced. Why, why, why is it so hot there? And then I went back to the video, and I'm like, what's going on here? And everybody seemed to have this. Turns out, he's just resting his hand. He's like, I'm going to push a bunch of times, and I'm like, I'm tired, I'm going to take a break. 
and and that's it just like pops right out and then it's like okay that's that's rest so that's a area of comfort that's area of rest and then we have some more blobs but one, one over here one over here let me go back to the presentation there right and then uh, uh, we talked to clinicians looked at videos to do some verification and we came up with some of them like uh, that would be like an abduction and that'd be an um, abduction and abduction and then like an elevation big gross uh, motor movements that you'd expect to see and they're all there uh, which is which is fantastic and this you can change this threshold thing to look at something that you did a lot or something that you didn't really do and what's all of this for so we talked about extra gaming we haven't really looked at a game yet um, so all of this is leading up um, to a game that we're working on um, where we can take all this data where we can see the person's performance at different areas, this capacity, the range of motion, and we can feed this into a game which will take this and sort of tailor the game to you, customize it to you, if you will, where it's going to be able to adapt to you um, as you go, and therefore kind of be like a personal therapist. So it could help with manual muscle testing, which is the gold standard right now, uh, range of motion scale, which is really looks at range of motion. Um, and mixed reality videos, the videos that you saw uh, with the green screen background, this is great for uh, therapists to look at to see what you're hitting in the virtual world and try to look for things like compensatory mo motion, so like this. You really don't want to do that when you're trying to reach up. You want to try to just reach up, not use a shoulder to reach up. The therapists don't like it uh, because it's really, they're, they're compensating for something that they can't do with their biceps. Um, so future work develop a VR game and use the baseline performance data that we have to set the game's difficulty and adapt. This is sort of like a little video that I have of the game that we're working on. Um, thank you. I'm going to allow one question. I'm sorry, I went over. Yeah, so I saw that you had your uh, design set up where you had a trial one, trial two, trial three. What I didn't hear was what your research question was, okay. or what your outcomes were going to be. So could you speak to that? Yeah, so the question, Briefly, please. sorry? Yes, that's a big question. <laughs> um, so the question really here was, how much does VR um, affect, how much does VR help with engagement? Mm -hmm. And the so how are you how are you operationalizing engagement? So we operate, uh, we're looking at engagement from based on just how much exertion you're putting into the game, how much performance you're getting out of the, into the game. So how far, how many balls you're pushing and how far they're pushing them. So did you look at range of motion? Yeah, but it, we didn't look at range of motion in the conventional sense, like from an angles perspective, but we looked at sort of like the, the whole the displacement of the, all of the balls. So displacement was your outcome measure? Yeah. Okay, that wasn't clear. Okay, yeah, I'm sorry about that. All right. Thank you. So uh, now we have Gabriel Popula from North Carolina State University talking about um, using unsupervised anomaly detection to analyze physiological signals for emotion recognition. Uh, we're running about 15 minutes late, so please try to keep your talks to within 10 minutes. All right, my name is Gabriel Fukula. Um, as uh, you said, uh, my presentation on using Unsupervised anomaly detection to analyze physiological signals for motion recognition. Um, I worked on this with my advisor, Dr. Corey Graves, and um, another committee member, Dr. Phyllis Ford Booker from Psychology. Uh, just brief overview. I'm going to go over the background and motivation uh, methodology. So. Um, overview of the process, uh, signatures, measures, decisions, results, and then future work and, and conclusions. So, um, anomaly detection. So, anomalies are basically data points that um, deviate noticeably from others. Uh, they present challenges in research, specifically when you're looking at um, classification or big data analysis. Um, 
they can vary in definition based off of what the uh, intended application is. Um, and uh, one of the biggest challenges is figuring out um, how to detect and account for anomalies in different situations. So I'm performing anomaly detection on physiological signals. So I'm using the uh, deep data set, which um, consists of a 32 channel EEG and uh, other peripheral physiological signals. Um, so basically, uh, galvanic skin response, temperature, respiration, um, vertical horizontal eye tracking, uh, any signal that's collected um, from an organ or body part outside of the brain and spinal cord. Um, motivation, um, when you're looking to do um, analysis on the data that you collect in experiments, um, sometimes you have like a crazy amount of data um, that has to be inspected uh, manually by experts and um, experts aren't always readily available. Um, and uh, in addition to that, when you detect anomalies, they can often be precursors to catastrophic events. So an example of that would be um, in aircrafts. Um, anomalous drop in airspeed um, is often, well, it's a known precursor to plane crashes. So um, if you can detect a precursor um, before the catastrophic event, then you can develop uh, proactive solutions uh, as opposed to reactive solutions. Or um, in another sense, if the catastrophic event occurs, then once it happens, there's nothing you can do about it. Um, so uh, in 2018 and beyond, the amount of data that we collect from various sensors is only going to increase. Um, and it's all been collected in a streaming fashion. And of that data, um, there may only be a small percent of it that's pertinent or relevant to um, whoever the experimenter is. Um, oh yeah, only relevant to whoever the experimenter mm -hmm. is. Um, so because of that, an approach um, needs to be developed that possesses um, the following attributes. It should be generalizable unsupervised, um, have low communication overhead, and uh, online capability for streaming data. So the detection can happen in real time or near real time. All right, methodology overview. Um, the approach I took is um, signature measured decision approach. It's based off of the uh, FIDA algorithm, which is feature importance event detection algorithm. Uh, it's a multi-step process that involves kernel density estimation, ensemble of decision trees, um, feature importance metric um, extraction, and uh, the FIM change detection. So um, the approach that I took is based off of the structure of this algorithm and not necessarily the individual steps in the algorithm. Um, and as I said before, I used the deep database um, and collected, which uh, were comprised of uh, various signals. All right, so the process, um, you start with your data preparation and pre-processing. So if you need to do any scaling, um, any uh, cleaning of your data or, or signal, um, you do that. Uh, and then you apply your signature, apply your measure, apply your decision, and then uh, you analyze your results. So um, that could be in the form of um, graph showing what percentage of your data was anomalous. It could be in the form of uh, a video um, or like a series of images. So signatures, uh, so the first, uh, necessary step is to apply a signature. A signature is a compressed way of representing data on a particular partition. So um, in this case, these experiments, um, I'm trying to detect anomalies temporally, so over time. 
Um, and in this case, a partition is just a segment of time. Um, they should contain all the crucial aspects of the current state of the data collection system for each node in such a way that changes can be detected within the desired domain. Um, and examples could be your per feature mean, um, your maximum amplitude, or uh, predominant frequency. Uh, measures are functions that are applied to these signatures in order to detect changes um, within your desired domain, so space, time, or a combination of the two. Um, your measures essentially compare uh, the signature of one partition um, to one or more other signatures that are, are available, um, and it computes a measure of the level of anomalousness. So your decisions are functions that determine whether the measures from a partition um, time step are sufficient enough to flag as anomalous or interesting. Um, so with um, your decisions, um, you can set like a threshold and you can set your threshold so you're looking for the most anomalous things or you can set it um, a bit uh, like higher or lower based off of how much you want to capture. So if um, you set a threshold of 50% because, you know, everything above 50% isn't necessarily anomalous, but it could be interesting or pertinent to uh, answering the question that you have about the data. So results, um, many experiments are performed um, because you're um, signatures, measures, decisions, they can be mixed and matched. Um, but uh, I'm only going to go over like a very small um, portion of that because in all, um, there were 32 test subjects, um, 40 stimuli, and then uh, 40 features um, that were looked at. So um, visualizing all that isn't really feasible. Um, and once again, all these experiments were temporal. So for the first experiment, um, oh, I'm sorry. So uh, the way I labeled the experiments were the features that were used, um, the signature, the measure, then the, then the decision. All right, so um, these are the signals from just one of the EEG channels, CP1, um, from the same participant for two different uh, stimuli. Um, and I'm comparing the um, signals based off of arousal, um, which is one of the uh, outputs that we're collecting in the data set. So I used um, all the features, a mean signature, um, squared distance from the mean as a measure, and then a threshold um, for the decision. So um, as you can see, uh, comparing the two signals, um, oh, so the orange is the anomalous segment, um, and the bluish green is uh, the original signal. So. As you can see from the results, um, there were uh, there were more anomalous segments in the um, in the signal with a low arousal than there was with a high arousal. Um, and once again, this was done for forty different signals. So. Um, the highlighted uh, segments of these particular signals may not um, necessarily be interesting um, or anomalous, but somewhere um, in that same time interval on, on one of the other 39 signals, or one or more of the other 39 signals, uh, there was an anomaly. Um, and uh, this is another one. Uh, I used all the features. Um, instead of applying the signature, I just used the um, original data. 
Um, and then the measure I used, I looked for a, um, a major spike, so um, a percent increase from the uh, value in one partition to the next. Um, all right, so uh, overall, uh, the goal of the anomaly detection process, um, in this case, is to reduce the amount of data that's stored and has to be analyzed by an expert. Um, the capabilities are shown in the results. Um, to further this work, um, I want to look at uh, testing the performance of the signatures measures um, and decisions on anomaly detection in the spatial domain. Um, and uh, make adjustments to take into account a uh, change in the representation of the data and um, uh, the different interpretations of um, whether or not something's anomalous or interesting. Uh, and then, yeah, uh, refine the results to develop a quasi-supervised method for identifying and labeling the different classes of anomalies that are captured. Any questions? One question, please. No? No, thank you. Uh, the next talk is by Ahmad Al Tamboli, yes. University of Rural. Yes, yes. Uh, good evening. Uh, about diabetic I know, I know that time is running. Good evening, my name is Ahmed Um I have to say is one of them is bad that when I prepare my presentation, it's supposed to take 30 minutes. Huh? But the good thing, uh, the good thing, I promise I will finish in 10 minutes. But some exclusions may apply, that no questions. I'm kidding, of course. <laughs> on using optical coherence tomography and optical coherence tomography angiography modality to uh, diagnose uh, one of the retinal disease, which is diabetic retropsy. Um, some notes quickly about what we are working for. The retina, uh, as you know, is located at the back of the eye and is responsible for converting the light into uh, neural signals to the brain. So, the diabetic retinopathy is a disease that affects this part of the eye, which of course affects the vision uh, system. Some facts about uh, this disease. Uh, we have some facts from National Eye Institute. It says that uh, near half of the Americans have diabetes. And the diabetic retinopathy is one of the outcomes of diabetes. And between some facts that say that between uh, 2010 and 2050, it's expected that the number <coughs> of American people uh, suffering from diabetic retinopathy may be doubled to reach about 14 million. Uh, the good thing is that 95% of vision loss from caused by diabetic retinopathy can be prevented actually if there is some methods of early detection of such disease. Um, our project uh, actually uh, <coughs> works on transforming the uh, OCTA and OCTA modality from subjective way, which is currently used by Officer justice into some uh, of quantitatively or objective way. Uh, the good result of this will improve, of course, patient outcomes and will avoid unnecessary treatment. Uh, I will uh, 
start with the uh, OCT part of our project. This explains briefly how our uh, computer edit system, our CAD system, using the OCT works. We take the OCT image like this and make segmentation to the retinal layers and we are able to get up to 12 layers and after this we extract three features of these 12 layers and by the way these features as considered the quantitative measure of the experience of the ophthalmologists because these features are the input of our CAD system that help in classifying the input OCT to either a normal patient or uh, disease one. So we organize our work to be like this. The first step quickly, which is segmentation, we use a joint model, which take the input image or the OCT image and compromise the shape and intensity and spatial model to segment the OCT image. The second step in the OCT uh, system is to extract the three features, namely the reflectivity, the curvature, and thickness from each layer of the segmented one. These three features are then go to the third step, which is input to our classifier system, take these values, and after, it, of course, it was trained uh, using previous scans, the input features of the new patient get into our system in order to give us a decision if this feature to an OCT scan to a normal or at this door. This consider like a real-time report that what our OCT CAT system produced. For example, we train our system to have a normal range for each feature of the three that I mentioned before. So if we input our system with a new input OCT image, extract three features and measure the value of each one and compare it to the normal range that is trained into our system and we found these values within the normal range, of course it states with an amount of certainty if this to a normal patient or not. But of course if we found that some of the values or all the values are out of the normal range, he gave us a report saying that was, for example, 89% that this input image is to a person with diabetic retinopathy affected. Quickly to the other part of our uh, uh, system, which is using the OCTA tomography uh, modality or OCTA. Uh, two important facts about the OCTA which make it uh, promising. OCT is relatively new, non-invasive rabbit modality. It produces image about the retinal vasculature system. I have to mention something that in our OCT part of the project, the OCT gave us information about the anatomy of the retina. But the OCTA gave us like information about the vascular uh, system. So, it gave us extra information in our diagnosing system. The same for the OCTA uh, system. It consists of four parts, quickly. The first part is processing, which preparing the input image, as you know, from some noise or artifacts, in order to be ready for the next step, which is the segmentation. And the third part, like the OCTA, which extracts the features, which is considered the, like the experience of the after extracting, by the way, in the OCTA, we extract four features. We input it to the classifier system in order to diagnose. Um, the four features that are extracted by the OCTA scans are namely the density, the appearance, and the distance map, and the bifurcation uh, features. Some results about our diagnosing, but in the OCTA part, we make it a little different. We have four features. We make like six experiments, taking some of them alone into the classifier and see the results. Take another two or another three, 
and of course, like what expected, to ensure that our four features are really important for our diagnosing. When we input the classifier system with the four features, it gives the best performance and getting an accuracy of around 95. The part which is the title of our project today is what about mixing or fusion of the seven features, three from OCT and four, four from the OCT. As an explanation of what we mean by our project is two. The classifier, instead of input this alone and this alone, we, of course, input the seven features directly to the classifier and, of course, expecting that the result will be better. And this will be the whole project as a whole. We will, in this time, input both the OCT and OCTA one time to the integrated system for the OCT and OCTA to extract the seven features, three from the OCT, four from the OCTA, then input these seven features into our classifier in order to get the diagnosing report. This is some statistics about the result, and as you see, we almost get 100%, but this was a study, so that explains why it's around 100%, because actually there was a challenge facing us that in order to test, we have to get patients that have both OCT and OCT scans, and uh, currently this may be, as you know, some from just based, uh, depends on OCT only, some of them depends on OCTA, so it was hard a little bit as a starting idea to get scans of both OCT and OCT. And we use several classifiers in our experiment. And the random forest classifier shows their performance. And as I said, it was around 100%. The next step in our project, hopefully we expect that, after discussing with our cooperator, so just that diabetic retinopathy has several stages. So the next step is to make like a gradient to the diabetic retinopathy because at early stage, they call it subclinical diabetic retinopathy. An average is called mild or moderate, and the worst case is called severe. So we hopefully uh, working on developing our system in order to give, in addition to the decision of diabetic retinopathy detection, give it a grade. The next step in our project is a future, of course, is to collect. Now we use one of them most non-invasive modality, which is OCT and OCTE. We, you, uh, and the result, of course, as I said, was around optimum. So what about if we merge <coughs> other information, like the clinical data and the genome data and the demographical data? Of course, this will enhance the results. So. Thank you. Uh, we're almost back on track. Thank you for being on time. But okay, still yeah. one question. I have a question. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, what was the hardest part in your project, like you face in uh, in, in building your uh, computer aided diagnostics? Uh, I mentioned during my presentation it was collecting the data because the idea of our. Uh, current idea is to collect data for patients that performs both OCT and OCTA. And this is actually hard because some of them just believe in OCT uh, result. Some others believe in OCTA. So you have to collect data for the same patient to uh, test. That's, this will hard, of course, in the future when you aim to get demographic data and other data. You have to get all this information to the uh, same equation. This was uh, the most hard part currently. Thank you. Okay, go ahead. So you had mentioned, you know, nearly a hundred percent classification accuracy. Yes. Um, but that's basically showing whether you have diabetic retinopathy or not having diabetic retinopathy. Exactly. Diabetic retinopathy also goes in a number of, you know, there are subclassifications. Can yeah. you identify those? Uh, uh, you know, whether it's uh, what stage of diabetic retinopathy it is. Um, second is, what is the cost and type? Yeah, uh, actually, this is a very important part, and this 
one of the future goals is to give a grading to our report. Instead of just saying it's diagnosed with diabetic, uh, diagnosed as existence of diabetic retinopathy, and that's it, we are going to enhance and develop our system to give a grade. And I said, we'll, our grade will be in numbers from one to three, which is subclinical, which is an early stage, means that the patient have diabetes and have some uh, little bit changes in his scans, which most of them just say subclinical. And the other grade, which number two is mild or moderate stage, and number three will be the severe, which is some uh, like uh, changes starts to appear uh, in the retina layers. Okay, this uh, regarding the uh, uh, first part of the question. The second part uh, was about the cost or the time. Sorry. No, uh, the cause. 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 What are the yes. type type of that because there are different. So you you will end up with different types of retinopathy. The different causes for a type of retinopathy can you identify or. Uh, yeah, exactly. This will be clear when we connect it with the other part, when we collect the clinical data and genome data. Of course, some of this will appear to us when we get this genome information. Of course, this will open the door for some of this in the future. Of course, that may be some, uh, maybe some similarity of the what we see with other diseases. So we will take this disease into consideration when we make our diagnosis. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to present uh, our work in spectral analysis of the EMG signals in patients with complete spinal cord injury during a standing with epidural stimulation. Uh, so chronic complete, complete spinal cord injury happens when there is a, after a trauma or lack of blood supply, uh, there will be an injury in a spinal cord and the injury is severe enough that could cause a uh, disruption between the signal that is sent from the brain and um, to the, in the to the spinal circuitry, uh, which can cause the excitability of the spinal circuitry to be uh, lower than the no, uh, normal level that, uh, that that controls the posture and the locomotion uh, in human, and it would cause in inability to stand and step. Um, so a spinal cord epidural stimulation is um, a method in which um, um, in, uh, in which there is a 16 electrode array that has been uh, implanted surgically on the uh, lumbosacral level of the spinal cord and uh, there is a stimulation unit that is located in the abdominal pouch and um, after severe, uh, after um, uh, uh, after locomotor training, um, a spine training and a step training, this method has re-enabled the patient with complete spinal cord injury to uh, stand independently, a step and uh, voluntary movement uh, to to move their limbs voluntarily, uh, and it also improved the muscle atrophy, the cardiovascular. Uh, bowel, blood, and sexual function in this in individual. It also, uh, so as, uh, epidural stimulation has several parameters that needs to be adjusted in uh, each task in order to achieve the best performance, uh, including the electrode selection, the intensity of the stimulation frequency, and the pulse width. So, um, here, uh, we are focusing on the standing task. So basically, during the standing task, the subject has been held by uh, several individuals to stand inside the standing frame, 
and we have one or two trainers that are controlling the knees and uh, one person that is controlling the hip and the trunk. When the epidural stimulation is turned on, uh, the trainer or the examiners, um, they have to look for the best parameters that would lead to independent standing. So the first one is when the standing is assisted, the stimulation is on, but the uh, and stimulation parameters are not um, optimized, so, uh, so they need uh, assistance. Whereas when they find the stimulation parameters that are optimized, the patient can stand independently inside the standing frame. And during this time, we record the EMG signals from uh, 16 leg muscles, eight on each side, most of them are surface EMG electrodes except for iliopsis that we use needle electrodes for recovery. The uh, EMG activation patterns uh, m during the standing assistant and independent are shown here. Um, even though we see some changes um, between the assisted and independent in the EMG signals, but we don't have any quantitative measures uh, to find what are these differences especially in the frequency domain. So the aims of this study is to find, uh, to, uh, to analyze the spectral characteristics of the EMG signals recorded from uh, during the standing uh, task uh, to better understand the mechanisms that is involved uh, with the epidural stimulation enabling the standing. And we want to classify, we want to see if we can classify the EMG signals based on the quality of its assigning uh, using time and frequency domain features. And also we want to see if we can predict, if this method, if this classification can predict which simulation parameters are, it can, may lead to a better standing condition. Uh, so the first question we needed to ask is that which method works better for a spectral analysis. So uh, FFT or Fourier transfer ha has been traditionally used for, for um, EMG analysis. However, in this application, when we calculate the FFT, uh, the FFT only because it has a very high frequency resolution, it only shows the frequency of the simulation um, uh, of the as a simulation and is harmonics and it doesn't show any information about the muscle response to that stimulation. Uh, so as short time Fourier transform is uh, trying 